Hey guys, some of the questions I've gotten with regard to uh, m analyzing the diode data and understanding how that works leads right into a conversation we need to have anyway about the concept of a generative model and how that relates to our understanding of data. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to throw together a quick um, video describing the idea of a generative model and how we can use that to understand if our data analysis is uh, working. So that, that's basically the idea, if it's legitimate. So a generative model is basically a mathematical model that can generate fabricated data, data that's, that looks like the actual data you collect, but, and you can analyze exactly the same way. But where you understand the mechanisms that were used to produce that data exactly, because you wrote the model, you built the model that generated the data, but you can introduce the kinds of statistical fluctuations that happen in real life that make it difficult to analyze data and see if your analysis can still extract meaningful inferences from the data that you generate. If it can, if it can extract the correct inferences, namely the parameters of the generative model that you used from your fabricated data, then you have some confidence that assuming the same generative model exists in in nature, when you measure some things in the lab, or at least if the mechanism is, is similar, that you'll also be able to make the correct inferences there. Does that make sense? So let, let, let's see how that works. So suppose instead of not knowing I0 and eta, as I don't know for the diodes that we measured in the lab, we have to infer that from the data. Suppose somehow I could know that through some other means, right? I, so I know eta is actually 2.3 or 1.3, whatever, 1.2. I'll just give it a number. Eta is 1.2. And let's say I happen to know that I0 is uh, 10 to the negative 6. Okay? I don't know how I know that. Just suppose that I did. And of course, we do know that the charge on the electron is 1.6 e negative 19 coulombs, right? And we do know that uh, the Boltzmann constant times temperature is about a 40th of an electron volt. So that's uh, a 40th is 0 0.025 uh, electron volts. That's uh, times Q, right? Uh, Q is the charge on the electron. It happens to also be exactly equal to um, the proportionality constant between electron volts and volts, OK? So uh, good, OK. And let's suppose that we're going to uh, use a range of voltages in this, and we're doing an experiment, we're going to use a range of voltages, and just suppose I happen to have uh, voltages VD that are, I realized I forgot to say import NumPy as MP, and then I also need to import matplotlibpyplot as PLT. Um, let's say that we're going to use voltages um, between 0 and 2 volts, and I want to use 20 of them, okay? But let's also say um, that, <coughs> well, let's just go ahead and use that. Now, let's build a generative model using those parameters. So that would mean uh, default my Shockley. I'm going to make a function. And the function takes a voltage, VD, let's just call it V, because I, I want to distinguish between the array voltages and the argument to this function. And it's going to return uh, I0 times the quantity E to the power Q times V divided by the quantity eta times KBT. Okay, and I'm, I'm thinking of KBT as the product of the Boltzmann constant and the temperature, which I happen to know at room temperature is about a 40th of an electron volt. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, and then I got to remember uh, I0 times, let's do this. That's the closed parentheses, that's the exponential, and then minus 1. Good. Okay. So that's my Shockley current equation. So I'll just call it I 
underscore Shockley. That's the Shockley equation. Now let's just check if I, I want to plot this and see if it looks reasonable. So what if I say uh, plt.plot, I'll use vd, and then uh, Shockley vd, and let's use blue dots. Okay. It's going to take a second to start up the hardware. And Okay, so one thing it's doing is it blows up, it goes, it's nothing, 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 and then boom, it, in one step, it goes through the roof. And we understand that, that's exponential uh, behavior. Also, notice, the cur these are uh, 10 to the 22 amps, so wow, my I0 must be really big. So let's make this uh, 20, let's make it 28. Okay. Now these are just amps, not okay. So my I zero was was crazy big. Um, so w the problem is I don't have any data in this interesting region where uh, I I actually need some data. So let's f forget about zero to two, and let's do um, one point seven five to two. Okay, that's looking a little bit more reasonable. In fact, I can still see that the the knee of my curve is very, very tight here. How about 1.9? Okay, now I've got some kind of reasonable range. Um, but the problem is, of course, this data is perfect because it's built from a mathematical model. And we know in real life it doesn't come like that. You, you always have some noise in the data. So what I want to do is generate some noise in my generative model that's realistic, that's sort of similar to the data that I actually collect, but um, that also has some randomness to it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, define IN to be a noise current. It's the current, if I were measuring the current directly, there would be a little bit of uncertainty in the current. If I measured it many times, I would get a distribution of current values at, at any given voltage that represents the noise, the statistical fluctuations in the current that I'm measuring. So um, I'm looking at the data and I'm thinking, uh, these are amps here. So what if I said a tenth of an amp, 0 0.1? Um, but then I want, okay, so what I want to do is uh, create uh, a distribution of uh, noise currents that add on to the actual model, the mathematical model current, that gives me some realistic noise. So I'm just going to add to this IN, which is a tenth of an amp, times np.random.normal. Remember, we use this function uh, in the um, in the exercises for uh, project one in order to calculate the probability of having a, a uh, value of certain distance above the mean. So th you can generate random numbers anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a statistical exercise. You can use it in a generative model. So we're going to, um, and I'm just going to say size. I want it to be the same size as the my uh, array of voltages. So I'm just going to say the length of V. And that's going to give me, remember these random numbers have a mean of zero. They have a standard deviation of one. And so by multiplying by IN, I'm getting a standard deviation equal to IN, right? And so uh, let's do that. And you'll see these numbers now, they jump around a little bit, right? They're jumping around. Um, they're, they look like real data, okay? So now what I want to do is uh, go ahead and, and let's do this. Uh, I'm going to let ID be I Shockley of VD. I'm going to just go, gonna go ahead and treat it as if it were data. Because that's how I want to think of it. It's like it's data. Okay, so now I've got, just like we had data from the lab, let's do the same thing with this data that we did with the data from the lab. What did we do? We did a, a fit, right? We called polyfit on this darn thing. So, um, and if you think about it, it was A and B were the slope and the intercept. And then I'm going to do MP polyfit. 
and I'm going to pass in for data the same data we used in analyzing the data from the lab. In the horizontal direction, it's going to be the log of i, and in the vertical direction, it's going to be vd, and it's going to be first order. And then my theoretical voltage is going to be uh, a times np times the log of id, right, uh, plus b. And now I can fit, I can plot everything together. So let's do that. We'll do uh, plt plt dot plot. Um, I'm going to do, I want to actually, let's go ahead and graph this. Same way we did. But now let's look at the theoretical. So instead of VD here, I'm going to plot V theoretical ID. And I'll use a red line. So there's my uh, fit. And you'll notice that this looks pretty darn good. It doesn't have the, and I could even do it, uh, you could do it this way. You could fit the linear version. Mm-hmm. Okay, why not? So instead of uh, instead of ID directly, we'll do the log of ID. And down here, same way. Okay, so there's my linear fit. And notice this linear fit isn't biased the way that real data was because it's missing it my generative model doesn't have the resistance in it. I haven't added the diode resistance to my generative model. I've just got the plain old Shockley formula. So it makes sense that this uh, fit would actually work quite well. Um, but let's see if we get the right... I put in an eta of 1.2 here. Remember, this is made up data. This is not real data. This is made up data. Let's see if my analysis can correctly extract the value of eta that I know is the correct value based on the fact that I generated the model my, myself, generated the data myself. This is why this is called a generative model, because I'm generating data. I'm making it up. It's not real. Okay, so wait a minute. How do I do that? Let's go back to... Um, actually, how do I want to do this? Hang on one second. Okay, I went ahead and just grabbed the uh, the GitHub repository with exercise two, and I'm just going to do a screen capture of this of these equations, and then uh, we'll pop back over to our the notebook we were working in here, this one, where we did the generative model, and we have the fit. We have a. What is a? A is the slope of that darn thing, and then what we want to do is remember the math. So let's go uh, let's go grab that. Okay, I can just have that handy here. Okay. So the math says that A is A to KBT over Q. So what that means is I can solve that for A to uh, inference, the inferred eta, it's going to be Q times A divided by KBT. So I'm going to take Q times A divided by KBT eta inference. It's 1.23. Notice that our original value of eta was 1.2 and what we estimated based on the fit was 1.23. So that's actually pretty darn close. Um, it's interesting to say, why aren't they exactly the same? Well, let's dial down this noise. How about we make it 0.01 instead of 0.1? Okay, now the noise has diminished a lot. Let's get a new value of A. Let's get a new fit. And let's get a new inferred eta. Now it's 1.203. So we dialed down the noise, and then we got a better result. Now in practice, we can't dial down the noise in the laboratory. The noise is what it is. Now we can, uh, we can average by making more measurements and try to reduce the noise that way. Um, but ultimately, we need a way to be able to uh, ascertain how much uncertainty is there in other words, what is a range of values over which we're confident the answer lies in this range, a confidence interval for the data that we collect? 
And we're going to spend a lot of the rest of the semester evaluating that confidence interval concept and figuring out what kind of confidence interval makes sense. For this particular project, I'm going to lay low with regard to estimating uncertainty. We're going to be, we're, we'll get better at that as the semester goes on. But understand that the inferred value of eta that you get is not going to be exact. It's got some error. And part of the goal of this course is for you to understand how to estimate that uncertainty and the interval over which you're confident that the actual uh, value uh, has. What, what interval is it in? Okay, does that make sense? All right, that's all I have for you right now. I hope that makes sense.